would you say is more dangerous? Living in the time of David and Solomon, the time when the Psalms were written, or living in our day and time? Back then, you might uh, suffer at the hands of robbers and thieves. You might uh, face lions. There were prophets who were devoured by lions, at least a couple of them. Snakes were danger. Plagues were danger. Enemy soldiers who had arrows and spears and swords. <coughs> Nowadays, the dangers are different, aren't they? Terrorist attacks, earthquakes, hurricanes, uh, just reading just the other day about a major uh, tsunami that struck the uh, eastern coast of India where Kathy and I were a couple of years ago about this time and uh, doing terrible devastation there. Some of you remember what happened on the big island in Hawaii about this time last year. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, terrible damage that was done there. And then of course there are terrorist attacks. I don't have to enumerate those that we faced, uh, reckless drivers, and even enraged reckless drivers. We call that road rage today, and unfortunately it does happen, and sometimes people lose their lives. There are countries today that are very unstable, people living in Venezuela right now. Things are really bad. So what's the answer to the dangers that we face today? Should we uh, try to live in a fortress? Do we need to hire the very best security? Uh, fortresses, securities, uh, you know, they can do some things to protect us. But I believe that Psalm 91 has a message for us today. And that message is simply this, that God is our ultimate refuge, that God is our source of security. And wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we can count on God to provide security and protection and assurance. That's what we're going to see in this psalm. If we rest in Him, we trust in Him, uh, we as Christians in India and Indonesia and South America and Japan, the Arabian Peninsula and the USA, we can rest and trust in the Lord who knows us and understands us and cares about all we go through. We don't know who wrote Psalm 91. It's an anonymous psalm. We studied Psalm 90 together a few weeks ago. It was written by Moses. And the interesting thing about this psalm, it uh, obviously, like all the psalms, was designed to be sung. And this particular psalm, if you study carefully in the original language, actually has three different voices in it. Now, I'm not going to try to go into all of the voices and the technical details on that today. But if you can imagine two parts of an antiphonal choir singing back and forth to each other in the first uh, four, 13 verses. And then a third voice, literally the voice of God, singing a voice representing God in verses 14 through 16. <coughs> then you'll have a little bit of a feeling as to how they use this psalm in worship back in Israel. But I believe in particular there are a couple of things we need to think about with this psalm. First of all, it is in essence a messianic psalm. And I would encourage you to read through this psalm, perhaps this afternoon before your nap or after your nap or whatever activities you have scheduled for the afternoon, and read it with Jesus Christ in mind. Because in reality, it talks about the protecting hand of God the Father on God the Son. And it even talks about how he was protected during his lifetime and you say, well, what about his crucifixion? That was a part of God's plan. And he was raised from the dead. And it says, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You read through this. Think about the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll see that in this psalm. But that's not the main focus that I want us to look at today. I believe that there is practical significance in this psalm and particularly as we see some of the things about the character of God. Now I'm going to tell you a little personal account from my own life about this psalm. It was about this time last year, some of you know that I'm diabetic, and because I'm diabetic, sometimes my blood sugar can go high, and sometimes, as some of you know from your own experience, blood sugar can go low. 
On this particular day, I was uh, in a meeting over in Fort Worth, and uh, the meeting ran a little longer than usual, and I had another meeting scheduled in the Mid-Cities with a couple of colleagues working on the Life Coach Training uh, Program, and uh, I thought, well, I'm going to wait until I get to the California Pizza Kitchen, and, and uh, when I get there, I'll be able to get something, and my blood sugar feels a little low right now. What happened, and uh, this is uh, God's truth, I actually apparently became semi-conscious, and I drove over 20 miles, and I finally wound up on the northbound service road of the Dallas North Tollway. And how I got from the edge of Fort Worth to the mid-cities to there, I have no idea. People were trying to get in touch with me. They were trying to reach me. But I believe that God had some angels that were steering my car and taking care of me. And what happened was, and some of you remember the white door on my blue car, the car that I used to have, and it looked like a police car. Uh, Jim was going to order me a light to go on top of it so that I could pull people over on Stone Road and add to the offerings that way. We, we never did get around to that. Uh, some of you know Jim would have collaborated with me on that. But the bottom line is, God protected me, and I believe that there were angels who guided that car uh, up against a curb and kept me from killing myself and killing other people. And so this passage of scripture means a lot to me. It's also interesting, I was reading in one of the commentaries the story about a young man uh, who actually had written the commentary on this particular song. And he told the story and he said, this is my song. I'm going to share it with you, but it's mine. He was a young child and he lived in Indonesia and he was being raised there by parents uh, who were believers and he developed dysentery and was at the point of death. They did not think he was going to make it. And uh, an uncle of his from a nearby village came and told his parents, this boy is going to live. He is going to, God has showed me through Psalm 91 that he's going to be spared, yet this is not going to kill him, that he will, in spite of what you've been told, he will survive and have a long life and serve God. And he did survive, he did have a long life, he did serve God to the point where he wrote part of the commentary on the Psalms, including the Psalm that he referred to as my Psalm, Psalm 91. And I hope by the time we get through looking at this Psalm that you may feel like this is your Psalm because of the personal promises of God here. Uh, uh, the first verse you'll see in uh, Psalm uh, verses 3 through 8 and then the last part of verse 9 through 13, uh, that's the second person. 1 and 2 are the first person. And then uh, you also see the second person in the first part of verse 9. And verses 14 through 16 are the verses that represent the Lord, the third person. But don't worry about the persons, just worry about the message of the psalm. The message of the psalm is that God is our ultimate refuge and our source of security. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that God provides security. What you want to notice here are the names of God in verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. These two verses are what we call packed with meaning. I mean, they are loaded. You know how some people go through a buffet and when they come out to the end of the line at the buffet, their plate is loaded? These two verses are like that. They are packed with spiritual truth. I want to think about the names of God, then the images of protection that God provides, and then the response. First of all, the names of God. The first one is the most high. El Elyon. This was the name that was found in Genesis 14. Remember when Abraham met Melchizedek and uh, he had rescued Lot and God had spared him and uh, then Abraham uh, paid a tithe to Melchizedek. By the way, that's where the tithe started. It didn't start in the law. 
started with Abraham giving tithe to Melchizedek. Uh, but this is the time when the name, the Most High God, El Elyon, was first given. In other words, God is sovereign over all. God is sovereign over everything. <clears throat> the second name of God that's found here shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is the name El Shaddai. Perhaps you remember the song El Shaddai, a contemporary song that was done a number of years ago. It's interesting to think about the name of this. It's found in Genesis 17, verse 1. Uh, El Shaddai, some interpret it as the God of the mountain, uh, but many interpret it as the God of the breast. In other words, it's a picture of how a mother, a nursing mother, nurtures her baby and protects her baby. And that's an abundant provision picture of God. And then the third name found here in this verse is the Lord. And you'll notice it's in all caps. It's the name the Hebrews didn't pronounce. It's, we pronounce it Yahweh, and it's found in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, where God makes a covenant with Abraham. It is the covenant-keeping God, the God who always keeps His promise. Now, my question for you is, have you ever had a person not keep a promise? We've all been there, haven't we? Been there, done that, and have a couple of t-shirts hanging in the closet. And the bottom line is, nobody always keeps their promises, but God always keeps his promise. If God promises to provide, to protect, he will do so. And then he goes on to say, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Here's the fourth name for God. And the word used here, again, is the name, my strong one. It's the Elion, the uh, name of, of God. Eloi, my strong one. He is the one who takes care of me. This name was used of God in Genesis 1-1, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And then the images of God's protection that are found here. The first one is the most high, of the secret place of the most high. And a picture of a secret place is a shelter, a secure hiding place. Um, some people in their homes build in a panic room uh, where they can go to hide out in case somebody attacks or invades their homes as home invasions happen today. And this is a picture that God has. It's used in Psalm 27 of God providing a secret place of hiding. Psalm 32, 7 and uh, Psalm 119, verse 114. God has a place of protection and then shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And the picture of the shadow there is a picture of the wings of an eagle, of a great bird, a mother bird. We find that same picture later in verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Most of us have seen pictures, and maybe some of us in person have seen nests of birds. I know if you uh, watch the uh, Animal Planet channel, uh, sometimes you'll see pictures of of eagles, uh, how the eagles shelter those eaglets till it's time for them to be pushed out of the nest. <laughs> and then the third word is the word refuge, Masam. I'll say of the Lord, He is my refuge. And the word that He uses here has the idea, and this is used of God nine times in the Psalms. It's the idea of a shelter from danger, a place where you can take refuge. It would be like a fort. Uh, most of you have studied uh, early American history know that there were forts in, uh, uh, in the Wild West, so to speak. Some of them in Texas, some of them up further north. Uh, there were some we visited in Nebraska when we were living there. And those were places where people took refuge or shelter. And uh, David had a cave where he went to for shelter and protection. And then the next word, my fortress. And it's interesting, the Hebrew word here is Masada. And any of you know the geography of Israel, perhaps have heard of Masada. It is a huge, um, large place where Israelites took refuge, and many of them were killed there. But it's a place where you can climb, and, and I'll tell you, it's an exhausting climb. Uh, you may be better off taking the, uh, the little... A cart that they have going up to the top, but they've got a fortress there on the top. It is the Masada. It is the
place of protection, uh, the place, uh, the military fortress that God has provided. And then how do we respond to God's protection, the security that he provides? Well, first of all, it says he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. God wants us to abide with him, to dwell with him, to be protected there. Uh, some of you, as you've raised your children, would have times when your kids would be playing out and uh, the daylight would begin to dwindle and you'd call Johnny or Susie and say, hey, it's time to come home. And uh, you'd want them to come home. You'd want them to stay at home. You wouldn't want them sneaking out into a dangerous world. And that's the picture here, to dwell, to abide, to be living closely in contact with the Lord. And then he goes on to say, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. A little bit different word here. This is the idea of a, the word of, of staying put, staying in that place of security where it's safe. I remember reading uh, during the Iraq warfare about the, uh, the green zone. Some of you may have read about or heard about the green zone. It's a place in a very dangerous country where war had broken out. And this is a place of relative safety and security. And with God, this is a place of safety. And then he goes on to say, I will say of the Lord, my third response, in addition to uh, dwelling, to being in touch with God and staying close to God, is to confess God. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. We need not be ashamed to confess that our trust is in the Lord, that we're relying on him. And then the fourth thing that we're to do in terms of our response to God is to trust in Him. He's my God, in Him will I trust. I will rely on Him in every situation. I won't try to figure things out myself. We saw in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not to our own understanding, in all our ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct our paths. That's the picture here. I'm trusting in the Lord, and in Him I will continue to trust. Well, not only does God provide security, as we saw in verses 1 and 2, God provides protection. And in verses 3 through 8, we see several forms of protection. And the emphasis in verse 3 is on surely He. This is the emphatic part of the verse. The emphasis on what God will do. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowl. Pictured there is deliverance from evil people. That He will take care of us. And, and uh, he is the one who will set us free. Uh, people in Venezuela right now are concerned because of a, a man that they perceive as a dictator, uh, a tyrant, a terrorist. And they're looking for freedom, for deliverance. And that's the picture here that God is the ultimate source of deliverance. And then from the perilous pestilence, deadly diseases. And we have many of those in our world today. Some of you remember uh, the Hanta virus, you remember uh, some of the things that uh, were coming over here from Africa at one time, and, and of course now we have the measles. Can you believe it? The measles, a dangerous plague in our world today. When I was a kid, I had the three-day measles, I had the whatever it was, two-week measles, the red measles, and many of you had the same thing. And now there are people dying from these. But God is our protection from diseases. Then he says he shall cover you with his feathers in verse 4. There's a picture of the mother bird protecting you. Under his wings you shall take refuge. God is like that great eagle that protects the eaglets. And then his truth shall be your shield and buckler. His word is a source of protection. And the protection picture there is of a suit of armor. The protection that we have. You may recall in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. You have the shield of faith, you have the helmet of salvation, and ultimately the one weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the truth. And then we get to verse 5, and he gives some more specifics here. He says, Don't be afraid. He doesn't say you'll never be harmed here, but he says you don't have to be afraid of the terror by night. I won't ask you if any of you have ever been afraid of the dark, because some of us, there are two classes of people. 
those of us who were afraid of the dark, and those of us who still are afraid of the dark. Mm -hmm. See, there's fear of the dark. And David says, because of God and His protection, we don't have to be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day. And I think of the, the dangers that we have of the shootings that have taken place in different schools, most recently in Charlotte, North Carolina, the shooting that took place out in Las Vegas, the school shootings that have happened. We don't have to be afraid of the bullets. We can trust God to protect us. He's not saying we'll never be subject to attack, but he's saying God's hand is on us. The pestilence that walks in darkness. There's the disease, the cancer, different kinds of illnesses, or the destruction that lays waste at noonday, the tornadoes that come. How many of you have gone down into a tornado shelter before? Quite a number of us here have been, been there. I remember uh, Kathy and I and her sister and a number of family members gathering in a shelter that was designed for about half the number of people that were packed in there. And uh, I remember us going down into our lower level of our house in Alabama when the tornado hit and decimated the top part of the house. But again, God took care of us. And that's the promise that we have. He goes on to give us, in addition to these means of protection, the specifics. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. That was our experience on April the 25th, 2011, when 268 people died in the outbreak of tornadoes in Alabama. And we were among the first to be hit, and God spared us. And uh, my brother's house was totally destroyed. He and his wife uh, in their neighborhood hid under their pool table in the basement. And I'm not sure I've ever thought to thank God for a pool table, but I think they did after that happened. God used that to protect. He says, it shall not come nigh you, only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Now understand, God's not saying here, that this is an every time guarantee that you'll never suffer. Uh, Job suffered. Uh, there are others who have suffered uh, down through the years. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. But God says we as believers need to be living in trust of Him because ultimately He is our source of protection. He is our source of security. And He says in verse 9, because you made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, this is the second voice speaking, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall in their hands bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Anybody remember where this passage appeared in the New Testament? Somebody quoted it to Jesus. Satan quoted it to Jesus. And Satan was taking it out of context. And Satan left part of it out. In fact, his quote that he gave, it's quoted in Matthew and in Luke. He shall give his angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up. He didn't include the part to keep you in all your ways. But Satan does, and he did the same thing with Eve in Genesis 3. He took the scripture and distorted it just enough so that the truth was mixed with error. And remember what Jesus said there? He said, get behind me, Satan. He said, don't tempt the Lord your God. And that was exactly what Satan was trying to do. However, I think what we find here is how this means of protection, God's powerful angels were taking care. And remember that when the temptation was over, uh, Luke's Gospel and Mark's Gospel both note that angels came and ministered to the Lord. And uh, I've known of instances, including my own experience, where angels took care of people. There's an account of some missionaries that were caught out on the road in, uh, somewhere in Indonesia, one of the islands there, uh, in uh, Borneo, Sumatra, somewhere in that area. And uh, they had to camp out that night. And they were afraid because they knew that there were tribal people in the area. And uh, they prayed and asked God to protect them. And uh, later on, one of the chiefs of the, the headhunting tribe there 
uh, was talking with one of the missionaries and they apparently had come to some peaceful arrangement. And he said, uh, he said, uh, um, ask him, he said, who were those soldiers that were protecting you that night when you were camped out? We were planning to come in and kill you. And there were 29 soldiers there protecting you. And uh, they found out later there were people praying angelic protection for them back in the United States at that very time. That God provided protection. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Now, just the fact that we have, uh, based on this passage, guardian angels doesn't mean that we need to take those angels out and put them to the test. You may have a car that has on the speedometer the capability of driving 120 miles an hour. That doesn't mean that you need to go out and test that engine and find out if it will drive that fast on Stone Road out here or on Highway 78. I guarantee you if you do, there are a couple of bad things that could very well happen to you. That would not be the way to claim God's protection. But I believe that this gives us a basic promise that when we're driving the freeways and the toll roads and the byways of Dallas-Fort Worth, or when we're in situations that could be dangerous, God will provide protection. Now, what are the outcomes of this? How am I to respond to this? He says, in their hands they'll bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread on the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. What he's saying is I can trust God in any danger. The lions were danger in David's day and the psalmist's day. The cobras were dangerous. The snakes were dangerous. Uh, all of these were a source of danger. But I believe God says trust me in any danger. But then he also says don't be foolish and test God as Satan tried to tempt Jesus. And that brings us finally to verses 14 through 16 where God provides assurance. And here God himself speaks and tells us what he will do. Because he has set his love upon me, I will deliver him. There's the first thing. I'll deliver, I'll save him. I'll set him on high because he's known by name. The third thing, you call on me and I will answer him. God answers prayer. I remember hearing from my daughter and my wife and colleagues and others who had been praying for me when I was on that driving excursion that I wasn't aware of at the time and hearing how they had prayed and God had answered their prayer. God says, I'll be with them in trouble. And I guarantee you, God was with me during that troubling time. The fact that I survived, the fact that I didn't uh, cause an accident that killed anybody else. I will deliver him and honor him, the psalmist goes on to say, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. The last verse, verse 16, is very much like the last verse of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the picture there. That's what God will do for us. Seven things He gives us here. And I believe the answer for us as believers is not that we will not ever suffer anything, but I believe we are immortal until our work on earth is done. One of the things that that incident that happened to me last year taught me was God had more for me to do. God had more things for me to be involved in in terms of ministry. So He wasn't ready. He very easily could have allowed me to be called home at that time, but he didn't. But when his time comes, then we'll go. And why does he do it? There's our part. Our part is to passionately love him. He set his love on me. I'll deliver him. He has known my name. We need to get to know God better. And studying these names for God is a great way to do that, to pursue a greater knowledge of God. And then thirdly, he will call on me to pray passionately and diligently and consistently and trust God and he will take care of us. So we love God wholeheartedly. We seek to get to know him better through his word. And we pray to him in prayer and God protects us. Yes, today the doctors can add years to your life 
with some of the medications and treatments and developments. But only God can add life to your years and protect you at the same time. Let's trust Him and not be afraid. Let's bow together. If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, that's where it starts. The knowledge that you're a sinner, you can't save yourself, none of us can. And to recognize the fact that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. He rose again from the dead to grant you eternal life.